So far in mechanics of materials, we have talked about different types of elements, like axially loaded elements, torsional elements, or beams, in which we discussed about how to determine stresses and strains, as well as deformations. We want to do the same for pressure vessels, but before that, we want to understand what are pressure vessels. Pressure vessels are basically the elements that are used for holding gas or liquids at high pressure. And there are plenty of examples that you are probably familiar with. For instance, propane tank holds propane gas at typically high pressure, and that internal pressure would apply some forces on the wall of the pressure vessel. What you want to do is that you want to understand what types of stresses are developed and how to design that propane tank in order to make sure that this is not breaking because of the internal pressure. But we don't want to limit ourselves to pressure vessels with that size. Has anyone seen any LNG tank here? Do you know how big is this one? So how, how many of you have been to the Cardinal Stadium, the baseball stadium? How big is that? It's pretty big, right? These ships are two and three times larger than that stadium. They are huge structures that are designed to hold huge amount of liquids at high pressure. There are some other examples. I know that many of you are, are majoring in aerospace engineering. A spaceship could be considered as a pressure vessel. Relatively, the internal pressure is much higher than the outside. Designers need to ensure that the oxygen inside the spaceship is not escaping from that. These are just some examples of the pressure vessels that we can consider. Generally, element that holds liquids or gas at higher pressure could be considered as a pressure vessel. Pressure vessels could be categorized based on their geometry in two types. The cylindrical pressure vessels and spherical pressure vessels. The shape and the geometry would affect how stresses are distributed within the structure, so we need to design them separately. In addition, based on the wall thickness, pressure vessels could be categorized into two different categories. The first one is called the thin wall pressure vessel. In the thin wall pressure vessel, the ratio of the radius of the pressure vessels over the th its thickness is typically larger than 10. In other words, the thickness is way smaller than the radius or the diameter of the pressure vessel. On the other side, the thick wall pressure vessels are those in which the radius over the thickness is typically smaller than 10. And the main difference between these two, on the thin wall pressure vessels, we can assume that stresses are uniformly distributed along the thickness of the wall. But on the other side, on the thick wall pressure vessel, stresses are going to be non-uniformly distributed and makes the calculation more difficult. So in our lecture today, we just focus on the thin wall pressure vessel. The advanced topic discusses about stress distribution on the thick wall pressure vessels. Now let's look into stress analysis of the pressure vessels. The goal of this stress analysis is to identify what types of stresses are developed and calculate the magnitude of those stresses. Let's start with the spherical pressure vessel. In order to determine how much are internal stresses in the wall, we are going to use the concept of free body diagram. So I'm going to cut this pressure vessel into half like this. There will be some internal pressure inside vessel because of the internal liquid or gas. That pressure is going to be uniformly distributed on that cut cross section area. In order to maintain equilibrium, there should be some sort of stresses developed on the wall of this pressure vessel to equalize that internal force that comes from the internal liquid. That stress is called sigma A. The resultant force of stress distribution is simply the magnitude of stress multiplied by the area. So the concept of equilibrium says that the resultant force should be equal with each other. So F, that is the resultant force of the internal pressure should be equal to F, that is the resultant force of the stresses developed on the wall of that pressure vessel. Now let's look into the area of each of these two forces. The area that we need to consider for the calculation of the resultant force produced by the internal stress on the wall is highlighted here. In order to calculate this area, simply determine the perimeter of the circle and then multiply that by the thickness. The perimeter of the circle would be equal to pi multiplied by diameter, and the thickness is shown by t. So the highlighted area is going to be pi multiplied by d multiplied by t. I want to highlight one thing here. When we talk about the perimeter, we can notice that the internal perimeter and the external perimeter of the circle would be different. So in order to calculate this area more accurately, D should stand for the average diameter of the outside and the inside. But when we are doing the calculation, as long as you are working with a thin wall pressure vessel, because 
the thickness is small compared to the diameter, it does not matter if we consider the external or internal diameter. All right, now let's calculate the area where that internal pressure is developed. That area would be equal to the inner circle of this vessel, which is pi internal diameter squared over 4. Now we are going to set these two forces equal to each other and calculate how much is stress developed on the wall. Sigma A multiplied by its area on the wall, which is pi dt, should be equal to the internal pressure, or P, multiplied by the area of the inner circle, which is pi diameter squared over 4. And sigma A is simplified to PD divided by 4T. That is called the normal stress that is developed in spherical pressure vessel. Note that we can cut the sphere in any direction and we get the same amount of stress. So this sigma A is the same in every direction in spherical pressure vessel. All right, now let's talk about cylindrical pressure vessels. In a cylindrical pressure vessels, we can identify two types of stresses. If we cut the section on the longer direction, there will be stresses, which is shown in blue. We are gonna call that stress as longitudinal stress. On the other side, stress that is along the radial direction or on the hoop direction is called the hoop stress. And we need to calculate each of these individually. Let's start with calculating the longitudinal stress in the cylindrical pressure vessels. The same concept as we have used for spheres. In a cylindrical pressure vessel, I'm going to cut that vertically like this. There will be some internal pressure that is uniformly distributed on the inner cut section. And in the same way, there will be normal stresses developed on the wall of that pressure vessel. So far, everything is the same as spherical pressure vessels. It means that the area, the inner force, and internal stress on the wall of the pressure vessel would be the same as the one that we have calculated before. So in other words, the longitudinal stress in the cylindrical pressure vessel is the same as spherical pressure vessels. The longitudinal stress would be similar to what we calculated before as PD divided by 4T. Now let's talk about the hoop stress, which is stress perpendicular to that direction. Well, I'm going to cut this cylinder and take out this disc out of that. And we are going to have one more cut, say, in the horizontal direction, like this. Once we do this cut, we can identify that there will be, again, two stresses developed on the cut section. One would be stress that is caused by the internal pressure, which is shown in red. And in the same way, there will be stresses, the normal stresses develop on the wall of that vessel. This stress is called sigma hoop because that is in the hoop direction. The resultant force of these two stresses should be equal to each other in order to maintain equilibrium in the vertical direction. So let's look into the resultant forces. The resultant force of the internal pressure, which is shown in red, is going to be called F, and the resultant force of the hoop stress that is developed on the wall is called F sub hoop. Note that in this case, we have two cut sections on the sides, so F sub hoop is multiplied by two when we are writing down the equilibrium equations. Now let's calculate the magnitude of each of these forces. For determining F sub hoop, we need to multiply the hoop stress by the area. An area would be delta x multiplied by the thickness of the pressure vessel, which is shown by t. Delta x is the arbitrary width of that disk that we cut out from that pressure vessel. On the other side, the resultant force that is developed because of the internal pressure is acting on this rectangle. And the area of that rectangle is delta x multiplied by d, which is the internal diameter of that pressure vessel. Now we are going to set these forces equal to each other and calculate sigma hoop on this structure. The resultant force produced because of the internal pressure is internal pressure P multiplied by the area, which is D multiplied by delta X. And the resultant force of the hoop stress is going to be sigma hoop multiplied by T multiplied by delta X multiplied by 2. Delta X is going to cancel out from the side of the equation. And from that, sigma hoop is determined as PD divided by 2T. Now let me summarize this. In the spherical pressure vessels, the stress is going to be the same in every direction, and the magnitude of that is PD divided by 4T. On the longitudinal stress for the cylindrical pressure vessel, the same amount of stress is observed, PD divided by 4T. But on the cylindrical pressure vessel, the magnitude of stress is going to be twice larger. That would be PD divided by 2T.
Before moving on and talking about the different types of stresses and also the deformations, uh, I think it's good for us to practice a problem. So this is the problem that I want you to try to solve. A hydraulic cylinder, as shown in this figure, is subjected to a compressive force of F. The allowable tensile stress in the wall of the hydraulic cylinder is given by increasing the internal pressure, there will be more stresses developed on the wall of the piston. And we want to know, based on the given allowable stress, how much would be the maximum force that one could exert on the handle of this piston. All right, now it's time to talk about how to solve this problem. In order to design this hydraulic cylinder, the maximum normal stress should be identified and make sure that that maximum normal stress is not exceeding the allowable stress. This is a cylindrical pressure vessel. On a cylindrical pressure vessels, the maximum normal stress is the hoop stress. It is calculated from PD divided by 2T. The internal pressure is unknown. The diameter, the internal diameter is given and the wall thickness is also provided. So we are going to set that equal to the allowable stress. From that, we can determine how much is the internal pressure, the maximum internal pressure that this hydraulic cylinder could take. Now let's look at this piston. The internal pressure that acts on the head of this piston is uniform. The force would be equal to the area of the head of that piston multiplied by the internal pressure. Area of that is pi diameter squared divided by 4. Multiply that by the internal pressure. That would give us how much is the force, the maximum force that could be exerted by the piston.